Hey, real quick before the show starts, I want to talk to you all about an upcoming documentary called Mental Health and Horror. It's a project I'm very excited to be involved in. If you see the film when it comes out, I will be interviewed for it, talking all about of mental health and horror. It's a full-length documentary being directed by Jonathan Barkin, and it's got so many cool people in it, from horror fans, horror creators, actors, mental health professionals even, all coming together to talk about what a positive impact the horror genre actually has had on so many people and why fans really gravitate towards it as a means of escape. I think that this is going to be really, really special, and if you want to take take part in supporting this film, they are doing another round of Indiegogo donations. There's actually one day left as of this podcast episode's release. So if you go to mentalhealthhorrordoc.com, that's mentalhealthhorrordoc.com, there's more info there and a link to the fundraising page if you would like to donate. All right. Thank you all so much. Now on to the show. What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. The final, final little pass is a business. A dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, your horror safe haven. I'm Chelsea. And I'm James, and we're married and we like to get scared together. All right, so here's what's going on this week. <laughs> I had an idea for a game that mm -hmm. I thought was going to be cool. It just didn't work. I was planning it. I worked on it for a couple days, and I think I was in denial. <laughs> and then I realized it just wasn't going to work. Basically, it was a thing where I was going to run horror movie scenes through Google Translate into a couple different languages and then back to English. And then we'd like James would have to try and guess what they were. It just wasn't working. It just either they were too weird and sounded nothing at all like the original thing and were impossible, or it was just really obvious. Yeah, so sorry. We wanted to do a game. Uh, but Like everyone's entitled to be afraid once. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Halloween. Yep. Yep. <laughs> it wouldn't be a, a great episode. <laughs> no. So instead, I thought, well, we've been watching a bunch of movies from 2021, uh, trying to catch up on all the ones we hadn't seen because it was such a, a cool year for horror and... I figured let's do a lightning round because we're not going to do an episode about each of these individually. Well, well, we should say why we've been watching so many 2021 movies. I know we've mentioned it a few times on the podcast, but I think usually at the end and usually as a like, we might make this thing happen. But like, it's pretty locked in at this point. Uh, it's going to happen. The Dead Meat Horror Awards first ever for horror movies in 2021. Yeah. That'll be on the channel on Sunday, April 3rd. Mm -hmm. It'll be not a live event. It will be an edited video, but it will have a premiere so that we can type, like everyone will watch it in real time and we can type in the chat room and stuff. We'll actually be in New York. So we might have to join the chat room from uh, uh, the airport or a cafe or something. We're going to be uh, doing a little, I don't know, mini honeymoon weekend trip. I'm really excited about it. Yeah. But yeah, the horror movie awards, we are having trophies made uh with plaques and everything we're having the shit edited out of this friggin award show uh so many editing hours are being devoted to this so please tune in on sunday april 3rd for this broadcast yeah and i guess think of it like a pilot for if we yes. do this again next year this is like a let's just see if we can do something like this kind of thing mm -hmm. um i wouldn't take this as an example of what it's going to be like every year if we decide to keep doing it yeah but. we're really seeing like what we can do with and how much work it takes which is a lot, a lot. <laughs> uh but of course the first time is always the the roughest as we're learning what to do uh the winners are just determined by Chelsea and I deciding between the two of us. If we do it again, maybe we'll bring in other people so it's not just us, you know, being like, oh, this was my favorite. But uh, we're hoping it'll be a fun time. And I, I don't know. We just want to honor the horror movies that usually get ignored by other awards. E even though there are other horror awards, we are not the first to do this. No. Fangoria's has had its Chainsaw Awards for a long time, the Saturn Awards. But, mm -hmm. you know, we're throwing our hat in. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And uh, I saw a few people worried that this episode would kind of spoil our awards choices. It, it won't. I don't think we're going to be like, this was definitely our pick 
or yeah we won't say which ones however uh we will be releasing a trailer for it soon and in that trailer we're going to mention the finalists not the winners obviously but the finalists for each category so that people who want to watch them all before the award ceremony can uh just like we used to do with the oscars we haven't done that in a few years but yeah i always used to watch the best picture nominees then they increased it to 10 and i was like what i can't i can't keep up with this yeah because then 10 like some years it makes sense other years we're just nominating stuff (laughs) green book book. (laughs) but that's why we've watched a lot of 2021 movies there are some non-2021 movies in here that we'll talk about uh some from earlier some from 2022 yeah but yeah we'll just go through here yeah so i'm sorry if this feels really slapped together that's (laughs) because it was because this idea i had fell apart at the last minute so i'm we're not the most prepared for this episode but it'll be fun it'll yeah we're gonna hang out and talk about some movies last time we did this was around halloween time last year when we watched a whole bunch of movies just because it was october yeah and i think people tended to like that so maybe we can have uh, uh time code links in the description so you can check out which movies are ahead oh, if you want to avoid spoilers yeah for movies you haven't seen but yeah uh yeah let's get into it we can only do about five minutes per movie because we've watched so many but i'll keep a uh, eye on the timer uh the first one i have on our list uh, i just keep lists of everything including all the movies we watch so this will be accurate we watched censor Ooh, censor okay censor i've been wanting to see because it's specifically about video nasty. Yeah, it's a and British film. I am obsessed with the that era of British politics, moral panic. We talk a little bit about video nasties on our episode about moral panics. That was from like a while ago now. Mm-hmm. The video nasties were this list put together by the the, the British government. Uh, so this was like government censorship of films. Uh, basically, a list of movies that they believed were um, inciting violence or re- like, you know, uh, detrimental to you. Y- yeah, yeah, exactly. They were they were providing basically like these movies were functioning as like how to murder kind of mm-hmm. <laughs> like how to do a murder manuals. And then you you would get stuff or someone would do a crime and say, oh, I did it because I watched this movie, which happens in censor. There's a, 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 an instance. It's a big plot where, point. Yeah. 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 So. Um, I find this era really, really fascinating. I love looking at the lists of video nasties because it's so weird going back now and watching some of them. It's like, oh, man, if they could have seen like Hostel, (laughs) they just, (laughs) you know. Um, So what so censor is about a, a, a woman who works on the censor board and basically just watches these horror movies and kind of writes what should be changed, what's objectionable, um, what should be removed, edited, etc. What I loved about Censor is that it really portrayed, like, it'd be so easy to make a horror movie about the censor board, which every horror fan hates. Every right. horror fan is going to hate the people who are censoring their beloved gore. And it'd be so easy to make a movie about those people and just make them outright villains but this movie doesn't do this we see a bunch of people on the board some of them are fighting to be more lenient and even the people like the main character who are a little bit more strict on the content you see their reasoning and they really believe that they're doing the right thing they're not just cartoonish villains out to spoil everyone's good time you see like their righteousness behind them yeah and the degrees to which people believe in what they're doing too that's what i imagine every government agency kind of is like is there's shades of people that work within it um even if the end uh result is something i don't agree with or i mm-hmm. think is a net negative but it's interesting that they this movie makes them the main characters and i mean as much as sympathetic as the main character is is she though yeah is, is she the thing? and then it's a nice exploration of you know the topic of censoring these video nasties and we'll we'll try to avoid major spoilers in all of these but the topic of, of uh censoring these movies has to do with like their detriment on uh youths like i said or on the general public at large but this movie delves into like the uh negative effects of believing in your own righteous crusade so much and right. i just love that the movie's fucking weird it's a little you know it's a little slow i can see especially maybe younger audiences being like oh i don't know oh, that third act though we're but putting it yeah it fucking pays off yeah dude. like <laughs> the third act is what made me love it 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 yeah. really freaked me out it it was very I, lynchian gets used 
like overused as an adjective, but I, I feel confident in calling this Lynchian. For it, sure. it specifically reminds me of Blue Velvet a little bit. Yeah, it's got a lot if of... If you've seen Blue Velvet, you'll probably understand why. Mm-hmm. And uh, up to that point when it really gets insane, I was captivated by how good it looks, uh, just the kind of tone of the film, how how much it does feel set in the 80s. It's not like a cheaply reconstructed uh, period piece. It does feel like it takes place in the 80s. And then, of course, I don't know how to pronounce her name, Neum or Niam Algar, mm-hmm. uh, the, the lead. lead actress. Holy shit. Yeah. Amazing She's performance. She's really good. Yeah. I just like to, because this is Prano Bailey Bond, right? Yes. Is it her first feature as well? I think it Premier might be. Premier feature film Let's, that we, she double wrote. Double check while yeah. I'm chatting. I okay. Guess. But I, I just love so much, too, that this horror movie is about like I think what is so important about being a horror fan or what horror fans really believe about this genre we like so much and horror creators too is that it's about not keeping things repressed or bottled up you Mm -hmm. know and because you know the people who are so like so opposed to not just not liking horror I understand not liking them but who are like we need to take action against horror movies it's like What's going on there, you know? And mm-hmm. that's a fascinating thing, too, to be so passionately against them. Prano Bailey Bond, yes, Welsh filmmaker. She had made three shorts in 2012, 13, and 15, but this was her feature uh, debut, mm-hmm. written and directed by her censor. Yeah. Fantastic debut feature. I just love so much that the big kind of emotional core of this movie is what kind of person are you when... You aren't looking when you're repressing things about yourself that are bad or maybe things you've done, because that's kind of a big part of this movie is this character may be refusing to understand certain things about herself or not wanting to revisit them. And instead, just focusing so much on what other people are doing or what's wrong with other people. And so that's something you feel like you can control, right, is you you can't control yourself almost. So you have to take it out on other people. I like yeah, that. It's, it's very great. creepy. And that's, yeah. And very ambiguous. Because if you saw the movie and you just listened to what Chelsea said and you were like, wait, what? I don't blame you because the movie leaves things very open-ended as far it's... as the main character's backstory and what happened. But, you know, if, if you do a little bit of reading between the lines or maybe look something up online to, to help you understand. Because, like, thinking back now, I'm like, oh, yeah, there was that part of, like, what happened there? So after we watched Censor, you know, we went online to read people's thoughts and a lot of people kept comparing it to St. Mark. Yeah, so I ooh, x out of those Reddit <laughs> threads because I was worried that that was going to... And it, it did a tiny bit... Uh, not give away what happened in St. Maude. But, but it led you to understand it, where St. Maude was I was anticipating going. certain things. Yes, yeah, so based... we watched St. Maude after this. Yeah, so yeah. I could sleep at night, although <laughs> it didn't, not like that <laughs> Yeah, help. that's not going to help. I literally was thinking about St. Maude last night, and I, I it freaked me out a little Oof, bit. Because yeah. I was thinking about, okay, we got to do the podcast tomorrow. What are we talking about? Oh, St. Maude. And I just thought about the ending, and I got freaked out. Yeah, fucking St. <laughs> Maude, another banger. Uh, very similar in some regards to Censor. And uh, yeah, uh, once again, in one way, uh, another debut film by writer, uh, by a uh, female writer director, yeah. Rose Glass. And it's another, what I love is it's another, it, it's cool how this year, 2021 at least, three. Yeah, St. Maude was like a weird, it was it's 2019, a weird, technically 20. A key, yeah, yeah, it whatever. had a bunch of, yeah. I just think it's cool that we're going to talk today about three. I think, unless there's more, unless there's another one I'm forgetting, three movies where it's made by women and it's about very unreliable female characters. Like, they're the, you follow them through the entire movie, but they're not reliable narrators at all. And all three of them, arguably, are not good people at oh, all. Yeah. It's like, they're not sympathetic even. Um, although they are to some degree, I guess. But they're, I think they're given a lot more nuance uh and unsympathetic qualities than we usually get to see female characters have especially a female character where they are your eyes in the movie yeah the main character right Mm -hmm. i we'll talk about this later when we talk about teton but okay yeah (laughs) i i had some thoughts about the like female um narrator not narrator whatever uh point of view or yeah kind of um but yeah this I Saint Maud, man. I I love this main character. She just this whole movie is just uncomfortable. You don't feel safe this entire movie. Yes, and it's uh another yeah, it's played by Morphid Clark, who's a uh, Galadriel 
in the new Lord of the Rings series. That's right. Oh yeah, cool, cool. She plays a hosp- hospice nerd mod who's a uh, hospice nerd. Hospice nurse. <laughs> She's kind of a hospice nerd. She has a little bit of a hospice nerd, yeah, too. She's a hospice yeah. nurse and a very religious hospice yes. nurse. Yes. Uh, uh, recently very religious. Yeah. As you t- come to learn that her backstory, she wasn't always this way, which, you know, I don't want to make blanket statements, but sometimes the people who are newly converts are the ones they who lean take in it the most. real hard. Yeah, as though they want to make up for their past. Well, that's like the, the born again. That's, yeah. you know, someone finds God and becomes born again. And it, it, it's a little bit like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't even know how much, what else to say about it without giving away too much. Yeah, I mean, she's tending to a uh, a terminally ill yeah. former dancer. Oh, I always I always forget how to say her last name. Jennifer but... L. Eel? Yeah, fucking uh, uh, Elizabeth Bennett. Yeah, I was gonna Pride say Lizzie Prejudice. Bennett from the Pride and Prejudice miniseries. The miniseries yes. Uh, I have not seen that, but you got real excited when you I realized that. I did get that. very excited. Mm-hmm. She's great. I she's fantastic in this. She she's like a um she's a a former professional dancer, and she's got very Martha Graham vibes. At least that's what I get from her. Where she's her kind of niche was like art, like experimental art. Yeah, da- like you know, not like. Uh, like a dance team choreographer, like a ballerina even, but very, she she would fit right in in the Suspiria remake. Yes. Yeah, that sounds right. That's her kind of area, I think. And the way she's living now, it almost reminds me of Sunset Boulevard. Uh, yes. She's not quite as like much of a terror, but she does have like a sharp edge to her. She's, she doesn't seem bad though. The way the one nurse talks about her, she's like, oh man, good luck. But she just seems... She seems mad that she's dying. I mean, which to is be understandable. Fair, yeah, especially yeah. when her whole career is like bo- the body. Like, yeah, she has lymphoma, so right. she's dying of that. And uh, uh, how old is she? She's fifty-two. Another uh, like I just, I just love women in like thirties, forties, fifties. She is. A, she's a gorgeous lady. She's a very attractive woman. Yeah. Now that we that now that we kind of talk about the. Yeah, her just seeming pissed off. Yeah, I think she's totally a dancer on purpose because it's when your career is your body, especially, Mm -hmm. you know, and to feel, you know, your body weight, like that's so fucking dark. Yeah, and so since she is, you know, dying, uh, Maud wants to take the opportunity to get her into faith and, you know, prepare her for the other side. And there's uh, definitely tension there. Uh, some some lifestyle disagreements between them. It's a little and bit of sexual tension too. A little bit because yeah, we do see uh, that uh, the dancer that she's taking care of does have some sapphic interests. There are some jump scares in this dude. There's one in in particular that fucked me up. <laughs> what I really liked is that for whatever reason, this movie starts and they're they're in the dancer's house and Maude's there attending her. And I just figured that we would be in that house for an I, hour and a half. Me too. I thought it would be a very closed, claustrophobic movie. I was like, it'll probably be good, but you know, you can only take so much of that. No, this movie opens up a little bit. Uh, it it It's more dynamic than I expected. The plot and the movement of the characters. And I was like, oh, I really appreciate this, this broadening out of the world of seeing Maude's past and seeing uh, how she reacts to the situation that she's put in and, and the changes from her hospice care. Oh, man. And she's just care. so uncomfortable. There's It's so weird. I, when we reviewed The Night House, we talked about there was a scene in the bar with Rebecca Hall that I was like, man, mm-hmm. this is so uncomfortable. This movie's got a bar scene to rival <laughs> how uncomfortable that one oh, is. Yeah. The way she just is acting around everyone where she she overhears someone's conversation, they're laughing, oh, and she no. just joins in and laughs with them, and it's so It's like this character weird. clearly doesn't know how to function socially appropriately and she's trying she's trying so yeah. hard and that's what makes her sympathetic i i was reading the uh director was saying she wrote her to she wrote her to for you to feel bad for her in some way yeah um she, she is a kind of a pitiable she yeah creature. i think she specifically said in an interview she wrote her so that you feel bad for maybe laughing at her yes and I Although mean, I don't know how much I that. laughed at her. I felt just weird, really weird and uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, I think, is the most thing. Of yeah. Just like, yeah, I wasn't really laughing at her because I tend not to laugh We're at laughing people. with Maud. <laughs> this movie's <laughs> I don't, even, a I don't riot. know about that either. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so I definitely recommend both of those movies. Great double feature. I think this is a, it's a really good double feature. I think St. Maud is hmm, darker. 
Um, more disturbing, although censors no uh, picnic either. They're not. Yeah, both of them are. Both of them um, are pretty fucked up. They'll stick with you. We love to see, like, again, the three, like, really big, like, women written, directed movies that we're going to talk about are all just fucked up. Yeah. In their own special, special ways. Although we will note for people who are going to watch the award ceremony, which should be all of you, uh... St. Maud is not in competition because of its, it's like it weird first came out in date, 2019. Yeah. We were a little bit lenient towards things that came out in 2020, but had like 2021 uh, theatrical releases. But 2019 is a bit too far back. Yeah. Uh, it would definitely be in contention for a lot, including actress and uh, the best picture because yeah. it was fucking awesome. Loved mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Visual effects maybe too. There's some cool stuff going on in there. There's some cool stuff. Okay, the next one was one that we didn't quite love as much. You especially really oh. didn't like this. Do you know what it is? Is it Antlers? It is Antlers. Antlers. Lots of people wanted us to review Antlers, especially after we did Ravenous, because Ravenous is also about the one to go. Yes, and was this a Netflix movie? Because I feel like the amount oh. of people talking to us about it just had that kind of netflix feel but no sure. i don't think it was i don't know if no. it was a netflix movie it felt very for me this movie feels like i think i talked about this a little bit either last week or the week before recently where i was like i'm kind of sick of the the trend of quote unquote elevated horror i hate calling <laughs> it that but it's like an aesthetic now almost or mm-hmm. a style and this to me feels very much like a let's make one of these kinds of movies and we'll put a bunch of big actors in it. And it's just all the pieces don't come together. Uh, I understand it was adapted from a story. I, I read the story, the short story it was adapted oh, really? from, and I, I liked that. Okay. And it's a bummer that it's it just pretty didn't. similar. Yeah. Did you uh, read the story before or after the movie? After. Okay, after yeah, we watched yeah. it. Yeah. Um, very, very different ending. The I Quiet don't... Boy by Nick mm-hmm. and Tosca. I don't understand why they changed the well, ending. Well, he, he helped write the screenplay, but yeah. co-wrote it with a couple of others. It just... I don't know. I mean, the biggest thing for me, and I saw this criticism of it when it came out, is the fact that it, it's a Wendigo movie, and it just... When you don't have... When it's not made by a native director, writer, I, apparently they had like a consultant. Okay. I don't, That's that can, you know, maybe, yeah. but it just sucks that it's one, it's so far removed from what that, that legend actually is. Mm-hmm. Like we discussed in Ravenous, the Wendigo having horns and being a creature is a very modern kind of invention. Uh, it's not really part of the native folklore at all and two it sucks that the only native character in this is the one who just does big exposition dump of what the wendigo is and that's kind of all they're there for Mm -hmm. it's just it's just kind of a bummer and eh, especially after you know reviewing ravenous and um kind of delving more into the history of the portrayal of that creature on screen and in other media it's like it just sucks it's it sucks to watch a really i think deeply terrifying legend of like folklore just being kind of repurposed for like a modern spooky creature sure yeah uh i think my issue with the movie is that it's one of those joyless movies it's really fucking joyless i that's what i hated about it too and it's not like censor or saint maud are a fucking bag of laughs or whatever you know it's not like those are like good times joke arounds no, but but there's some there's some joy in them it's weird even in the moments where those are fucked up and so dark there's it's it's not even quite like what's going on on screen it's the feeling i get it, it's almost like the intent of it like you can feel the person making this thing putting i i don't it, know maybe it's just they're more interesting i mean antlers, there's that too <laughs> antlers feels kind of rote to me uh i think it looks great I think it like look, visually, Antlers visually is stunning and the, shot the, very well. The one to go as much as I, you know, we discussed before. The design is a very modern uh, invention, and but it as a creature removed from that context, really cool. The really effects scary. are great. Mm-hmm. The acting is all is good all the around. The kids are incredible. The, in yeah, this, but that main kid is very good, uh, and then Jesse Plemons always a joy. I love. 
and Carrie Russell. Jesse Plemons and anything is I'm happy. Yeah, Carrie Russell. Uh, I enjoyed her so much that I went and watched the pilot of Felicity because so I'd never seen it, and I thought Felicity that pilot I thought it was a very good episode <laughs> of television. J.J. J. Abrams. I just the the tone of this just feels very. This movie just really feels like it's got to be about something. Yeah, man. it feels like it takes itself too seriously. It takes itself way too seriously. It's, it's got all. It's got all the like. It's uh, poverty porn. Mm-hmm. It's very much like look at the conditions these poor people live in, kind and, like, of thing. child and abuse and like child meth abuse. Labs and... It's it's just because not e- not only is it like these kids, yeah, living in poverty and. At first, you maybe think, oh, is the dad abusive? Like, what's going on here? I, I do like that we learn that the dad isn't, like, an off. Uh, yeah, he's, like, looking I do out for like his kids. that I kind like that. of reveal where he is realizing, oh, my gosh, this is what's happening to me, and he has to protect he's, like, protecting he's pre- his Yeah, kids. so I think that was neat. Mm-hmm. But then there's the whole Carrie Russell backstory with she, her dad. Yeah. And I don't really know. What, I think sexual abuse. It definitely yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. It just, it just feels like it, just piling on stuff just to have it in there so that it's a serious movie mm-hmm. you know so yeah just i think totally it... weird and the writing i thought was kind of yeah like we said before it's just kind of joyless there's no not even i don't need characters being funny or making jokes but it just ugh, it's just such a slog i don't know i did not like that movie <laughs> yeah and I... the ending was really stupid i'm sorry what the very end mm-hmm. okay uh like the, the whole like the, the climax of it Oh, in the cave? Yes. So I hated it. Uh, I don't remember. I know, and we can't talk too many spoilers, but people who've seen it know. I okay. Think. It just we have a we have a thing established this entire movie Fuck. with with how this creature is and how um scary it should be, and then all of a sudden the climax of this movie is like I don't know. <laughs> Feels like they all just kind of stand around kicking it. Sure. To death. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> All right. So yeah, I I felt very middling with it, maybe slightly negative, but yeah, I know that you definitely were not a fan. I think we also had just come off watching a bunch of movies that were really weird and were trying things, and this yeah. just felt so by the numbers. This mm-hmm. is a serious movie that we are taking seriously, and it's prestige, and we demand you take it seriously. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, next up is the third of the trilogy of. Fucked up women written and directed oh by women. Uh, Teton. Yeah, let's just talk about Teton in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, Easy. right. I, uh, I would love to do a whole episode on this movie. I don't think I could. I don't think I'm uh, capable of it. I don't think I am um, smart enough to talk about <laughs> Dude, Teton. that's exactly how I feel. I'm just, I wouldn't know what to say <laughs> about it in a way that sounds intelligent at all. I think that there's, at this point, people who are smarter than both of us <laughs> who have really incredible takes on this film already. And I don't know. It, this I think this movie, for me, I, I loved it. I, I think it's incredible. It's like just a fucking work of really brutal art. But I don't know if I could talk about it for an hour because my, my reaction to it is so emotional and less oh okay i have thoughts about what this movie means yes it just feels like i experienced it and i don't necessarily have a a, a hot take on it or anything there were times watching it especially a little earlier on where i was like i don't know if i like this but this is i'm captivated yeah like no matter what i liked or didn't like about the movie i was enthralled the entire time and i think i tweeted that it's one of the most creative movies. Yes, that that's I've, the thing. How do you come up with this? Both of us watching this had a m- many moments, I think, <laughs> where we just thought, how do you just come up with this movie? Because it's so, it's so specifically weird. <laughs> yeah, it was written and directed by Julia Decornau. Decornau? Decornau, a French, it's a French it film. Raw. She did Raw, which I have yet to see. Yeah. Because uh, it's part of the, what, the French New Wave Horror or whatever? Or New Extremism. New Extremism, that's right, I'm sorry. Yeah, which, this is like maybe more surreal than that, though. This is, no, this is body horror. This is very, if you like Cronenberg, I think you'll, you'll yeah. like this movie. This is doing some nasty body horror stuff. Uh, there are like some kills in it because... Uh, you know the the lead um, played by Ag 
Agatha, or yeah, Agatha Roussel in her feature film debut. Yeah, what the fuck? Listen, she gives her body and soul. Oh, was to she like a model movie. or something? I think so. Oh, a French journalist, model, what? and actress. Dude, okay, she she truly like gives her entire self to this movie. She's like naked I'm half not, the time. I'm not exaggerating. It's the most like I don't know. It's really watching someone just truly just know like. No, not holding back at all and really living in this movie. It's incredible, I yeah, think, to just watch her. The bravery, I guess. To, yeah, and I to hate do the like, things. It's such an award season thing to be like, this performance yeah. is so brave. But honestly, this performance is so brave. Just <laughs> not because of the things, she, you know, yeah, she gets very naked in it and. She fucks a car. All right. We all know she fucks a car. That's... I didn't know that she fucked a okay, car. I'm glad so you didn't it was, know that. It was a surprise to but me. But just the. I don't know, like the emotional vulnerability is like, I think that's maybe why I'm like, it's so brave. Especially because for a lot of the movie, she's not speaking and just yeah. has to convey all these emotions and stuff uh, through facial expressions. And then uh, let's like not- she sells this this movie, which is a weird ass concept. You play this this role any less realistically or honestly, and this movie doesn't work. And Especially because early on, like, you first meet her, and it's it's sympathetic, the shit she's going yeah. through. And then it flips a switch where it's like, what the fuck's the matter with her? And, like, she is a bad person. Yeah. And then it brings you back around to, like, having some sympathy. Yes, and the, with uh, what's Vincent this? Linden playing the uh, firefighter. Oh, my God. That I guy. literally <laughs> think about him and want to cry. He... <laughs> He just, again, another performance where I'm like, fuck, your whole heart's just there. And it's like, why are you roiding up, dude? I know. You're not training for anything, but you're killing yourself to, like, just, I don't know, maintain your strength. And well, I, it's 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 like a masculinity thing, yeah. you know? And I saw a review that pointed out that his bathroom that he's in is all pink, and there's all this pink and purple with the firemen and stuff because it's this weird masculinity play where they're all just, you know, trying to prove something, but they're constantly surrounded by these very feminine colors and music, and it's so interesting, and their whole relationship is like he... Oh man, he just breaks my heart. He's such he almost is, I think, the character you're you're actually supposed to sympathize with rather he than is her. the one who I like but felt also, the most attached to. This is what I was hinting at earlier when I was talking about the the kind of female, unreliable narrator, unsympathetic main character, where I kind of thought to myself at first, like, wait, why should I feel sympathetic? You know, she's she's a she murdered people. She's a bad person. But then I think like, well, there's so many other instances in horror movies where you think like, I can fix him. You know, <laughs> I love my horror bad boys. And you want to that there's something about a sympathetic killer in horror, not in real life. Yeah, <laughs> but not in, in real life. But like in, in a horror movie where you just think, man, something went so horribly wrong here. And you, uh, the character, you just want to save them. And that's a little bit of what happens here. And I found myself wondering, was I less sympathetic because it was a, a female character? I don't know. It's almost as though like the devil's reject characters found themselves in a situation where someone was trying to help them. Yeah. Because it's a similar situation where like her early on is like doing a killing spree and it's like innocent people who you feel bad for and like, and, yeah. but then yeah, I don't know, man. I just think you have to look at this movie as and I think that's probably why it's important that the scene where she literally fucks a car uh, is before the whole killing spree thing is because I think She's telling you this movie's heightened. This does not. This movie does not um, kind of exist in our world. This exists in like a weird heightened universe where every, like emotions are heightened, reality's heightened, everything is surreal. Mm -hmm. And so I think then it's a bit easier to let yourself go and be a bit more forgiving of this character who goes and does some fucked up shit because the entire world of the movie is so kind of bizarro. But. It was selected as the French entry for Best International Feature Film at the 94th Academy Awards, but did not make the shortlist. It didn't get nominated for Oscar? No. Of course it didn't. It won the Palme d'Or, though. Yeah, but it's the Oscars, and it's a horror movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> that, that, 
really hurts. This movie's really it's, um It's fine. It'll do it, it's, it won so many other awards and I think the Oscars I, are proving themselves I, less uh, and less relevant. I think every just year. the more I live with this movie and the more I think back on it, the more I'm like really affected by it. It's there's, it's an experience. There's a lot of emotion in it mm-hmm. and a lot of um catharsis too and god there's a scene where it's a bunch of firemen dancing to future islands <laughs> yeah that's all it is and that's <laughs> i love future islands and i at that moment i was like you know what julie we're on the same page <laughs> hey want to talk to you about our first sponsor this week keeps now we love bald kings on this show all right But maybe you want to keep your hair and maybe you're noticing that you're starting to go a little thin up top. In fact, two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35. Keeps offers a simple stress-free way to keep your hair. You don't even have to go anywhere. They offer convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered right to you every three months. The treatments start at just $10 a month, so those are low cost, and they offer the generic versions of their medications too. And again, this is hair loss prevention. It's not gonna make you grow any hair back, but it will prevent any more from falling out if you don't want it to do so. I know James's family has male pattern baldness that runs in the genes and he takes hair loss prevention medication and so far it has worked like a charm. He's very, very happy with it. So if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash deadmeat to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash dead meat to get your first month free. K-E-E-P-S dot com slash dead meat. Our next sponsor this week is Dadgrass. You know what's really, really scary? Getting too high. It sucks. It's not fun. There are so many medicinal and therapeutic benefits to weed, but also weed can accidentally get really, really scary if you're not careful. Dadgrass are pre-rolled joints that are low in THC and high in CBD, so you get all those nice effects of CBD while keeping a clear head. It's legal organic smokable hemp, but if you don't want to smoke, Dadgrass also offers a CBD tincture made with the same high quality hemp. They compare to having a glass of wine, which I think is pretty accurate having tried some Dadgrass myself. All Dadgrass products are federally legal for ages 18 and over, and it's shipped right to your door anywhere in the U.S. Right now, Dadgrass is offering our listeners 20% off your first order when you go to dadgrass.com slash deadmeat. Go to dadgrass.com slash deadmeat for 20% off your first order. Dadgrass.com slash deadmeat. And for our next sponsor, while we're on the subject, another fun way to ingest weed is edibles. But edibles often are scary. In fact, I think that they're the easiest thing to mess up and accidentally go too far with. There's truly nothing worse than realizing you've had too much because you just gotta wait it out. There's no going back. But if you're looking for a nice medium level high, Diet Smoke is there for you. They are Delta 8 THC gummies. Delta 8 is basically a slightly less potent THC, and THC is the psychoactive ingredient in weed that will get you messed up. Both are natural to the cannabis plant, but Diet Smoke extracts their Delta 8 from hemp. And because it's extracted from hemp, that means it's legal in most states and non-prescription. You just have to look at Diet Smoke's website to see if they ship their gummies to your state. They kind of describe their high as between the chillness of CBD and not quite as stoned as you're going to get with regular weed. So if you want to try out Diet Smoke, you can use our promo code DEADMEAT for 20% off your order. Go to dietsmoke.com and use promo code DEADMEAT for 20% off your order. That's dietsmoke.com promo code DEADMEAT for 20% off. Diet Smoke's Delta 8 THC gummies are not for use or sale to people under the age of 21. Please use responsibly. All right. Next up was uh, something not quite as groundbreaking. Okay. Black Friday. Oh, Black Friday. Oh, geez. Okay. We're... uh... That is quite the 180 from Titan. Yes, it is. In like Black, so many aspects. Black Friday. You know, I'm just realizing this is a 2021 movie that we have not clipped for the award show. We better get on that. Because, sure, yeah. Uh, it, it did, in fact, have a 2021 release for sure. And um, 
was a movie with, you know, some of our faves. Devin Sawa. Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell, uh, playing a very non-Bruce Campbell-like character, very cowardice. Yeah, uh, that was a store weird Store manager. Uh, Michael Jai White, friggin' Spawn, mm -hmm. he's in here. And then we were excited to not only find out that uh, the lead lady, Ivana Baccaro, is the, she was in Pan's Labyrinth. She's mm -hmm. the she's young the girl, girl in yeah. Pan's Labyrinth. But the the leading dude in here, besides Devin Sawa, uh, is played by Ryan Lee, who has has grown into a very uh, pretty man. He's beautiful. He's a beautiful he boy. He looks like a cartoon. Yeah, uh, very Jack McBrayer vibes. Yeah. But when we realized who he was, uh, this kid was in The Trophy Wife. Which is I think now it was just Trophy Wife. Just Trophy Wife? Uh -huh. uh, probably 10 years ago now. Yeah. A criminally Very underrated series. one season show. What was that on? ABC? I don't even know. ABC or something like that. It was that. a network a sitcom uh, called Horribly Trophy Wife. Horribly named, amazingly written. Malin Ackerman, so funny. Bradley Whitford. Yeah. Like so many. We were devastated when it got canceled. We loved it. And uh, this kid was hilarious on it as kid, a kid. He was so funny. He must have been like 15 or 16 on the mm -hmm. show. And now he's a, a grown I'm really, man. I was happy to see him again. Yeah. Unfortunately, despite the best efforts of the cast, neither of us enjoyed this movie. I really didn't like this movie. It I is, don't feel as bad because the director is like an established uh this isn't like some young person's first movie that we that we didn't like and aren't gonna be super nice. He's an to. Emmy Award winning director. <laughs> yeah, he's Holy fine. Shit. Okay. He's fine. He did a lot of live television a lot of, and yeah, stuff. Music, and music stuff. stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't like it. It's and a horror comedy, which is gonna be a hard sell. It's for a hard sell for me. Period. Yeah. If you tell me up front something's a horror comedy, I'm already kind of <sighs> mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think we agreed that, strangely enough, the biggest weakness of this film is something you don't often hear in, in your brief criticisms of film, but the blocking. Yeah, it was so <laughs> weird. We couldn't put our finger on why it fell off. The entire movie, we both were like, this something like, just this feels working? weird and we can't figure out what it is because it looks really nice. Everyone's acting amazing. Acting's great. The effects are pretty the cool. The effects really good. Yeah. What the fuck isn't working here? And it's the blocking. The which is the the positioning of the characters. Yeah. So if I'm directing you in a scene, if I if I'm directing James and I go, mm -hmm. okay, here's what you're gonna you're gonna say your line, then you walk over and sit in a chair. Me telling him to like walk over and sit in a chair is the blocking. It's just like where you're gonna be. It's that, and also I don't know if it's technically blocking, but just another issue with this movie is like the framing of where people are, and especially from scene to scene, their relative position to each other and the other action going on at the same time. Yeah, all of that's a mess in this movie. Yeah, it's it's like you don't have a sense of like where everyone is physically, like the layout of the place they're at and what actions taking place where. So then you don't really understand the danger they're all in. It's all it's all kind of weird because they're working at a muddy. toy store and it's Black Friday, you know, the day after Thanksgiving, and uh, customers are like possessed by like an alien force, and so they're running around. It's very cooties esque. Yeah. And this movie actually made me appreciate cooties more because uh, cooties, you always have a sense of danger with the kids. You feel like they are a scary thing. With this movie, people are just like walking around and these possessed uh, shoppers don't seem to really pose any danger because like the, you just don't see them interact. And then the other issue I had with this movie was that the characters felt so mercurial, like their their oh yeah conflicts that with the each other, other yeah. just like whatever what the script needed at the time. Yeah, there's a few of the characters, especially they kind of go back and forth between oh they're a coward, but actually they're gonna personally sacrifice something in this scene but then they go back to being a bad person that it's very kind of all over the place yeah and again to compare it to cooties just because i feel like it's pretty similar tone and structure wise cooties for all its faults you knew those characters like they might have been like really thinly sketched cartoon characters but it was like okay uh you had like the conservative uh teacher with uh was it nasim pradad is that right yeah name? the yeah yeah, yeah yeah and like uh friggin um Dwight. Dwight from, yeah. Yeah, he's he, like the, the, the alpha douchebag. Like, you knew those yeah. characters. These were not quite as developed and unfortunately just 
couldn't really hold our attention. Um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of weaknesses. Kind of checked out of this one. Cool yeah. effects, though. There's a lot of cool practical stuff. A lot stuff. of cool stuff going on there uh, yeah. as far as the effects go. So you can check that out for them. Uh, <laughs> the next movie we didn't watch, or the next movie we watched was not a horror movie, but I just want to briefly bring it up. We watched The Pest. It is possibly oh, the worst movie. Why would I, you bring it up? Because it's on my list of movies that we watched We watched recently. it on our one month anniversary, guys. I'm so sorry. <laughs> our plan, it was like, oh, happy one month anniversary. Let's put on a movie and work on a jigsaw puzzle. And James insisted on watching The Pest. No, I would have. I would have taken some pushback. I would have relented. But I was like, hey, there's a We Hate Movies, which That's, is the only reason we didn't turn reason the movie we off. the movie. That movie would have been shut off five minutes in before the end of a stupid <laughs> like, fucking it's, song. It's truly like, you know, okay, we all love a, a movie that's so bad, yeah, right? Not Th the this is truly so bad that it's. It's unwatchable. Like it, I came out of it be a worse person. And we love John Leguizamo. I love John Leguizamo. But don't watch the past. Oh it my is, god! It, it truly. And if you're thinking, "Oh man, I gotta check this," don't, don't, it, don't. Like, truly it's incompetent. Don't. It's, it's not funny. It's, it's offensive. It's, like it's offensive on so many levels. It is offensive on every single level. A movie can be offensive. <laughs> it's like racist. It's homophobic. It's like it is truly just every, every like go down the list and just check off everything. It's. It's so fucking bad. It's really bad. Just don't. I don't know why you even brought it up. I'm sorry. It was on my list. Oh, God. Don't fucking watch The Pest. Every copy of that movie should be burned. Yeah. Literally, the We Hate Movies guys said it's maybe the worst movie they've ever watched. And their job is to watch bad movies. And they've been doing it for 10 years. Mm-hmm. Yes. After that was The Boy Behind the Door. Oh, yeah. Okay, so The Boy Behind the Door, which we did a commentary track on. If oh, yeah, you want to hear our reactions real time to that movie. I liked it. It was like a nice, tight thriller. I thought it was a it was a good survival script where it's kind of a, a one location survival thing. Very where cool you, house that they're in the whole time. Yeah, and you're, you're using what's at your disposal to survive a situation. I'm always kind of into that stuff. Yeah, and it's about two, I think, 12. 12, 13 year old boys who get abducted and then you're right trying to figure out how to get free and uh we were saying during the commentary track how that age is the perfect age for a child protagonist in a horror film mm -hmm. because uh too much younger than that and you're like i don't want to see them in danger they don't really know what's going on right uh, but if they're any older you can be more like well they should be able to maybe overpower them when you're 12 13 even if you grab yeah like, a it's still the fear of oh my god they're so young and they're in danger but they are smart enough to figure their way out of a situation it's why stephen king has so many I stories so, about yeah. characters that age it's because you know it's, it's that sweet spot of like and it's probably tied to how that's really the age where you're starting to become an adult and, yeah, like and you're starting to understand the world a little bit more. Yeah, so the age where I think most of us start to understand the world isn't always fair or nice or good. And yeah, yeah, and, and the, adults maybe are can't you can't always trust adults or that adults aren't always going to do the right thing. The performances really by the good. two kids, great, especially Lonnie Chavis, who I think takes the lead in this. He's the one who uh, has more freedom within the house and is able to run around. He was uh, young Randall Pearson on This Is Us. I've never watched This Is Us, yeah, but it's a maybe. big show, right? So It's a pretty big uh, show. Yeah, people... All I know is that the dad in that gets killed by a crock pot. Whoa! Oh, is that like a the inciting incident for the show? Yeah, I think it was like a, a reveal, though. It was a... Oh, like he's dead when the show starts. Yes, and, and then, then it was, how did learn. he die? And then he died via crockpot. Wow, hon, way to drop that bomb on it us. Was, it was in the news, dude, because it was <laughs> such a weird, disappointing reveal. <laughs> oh, people didn't like it? It was the thickest. It was so stupid. I don't know. I'm kind of into it. I want to see how it plays out. <laughs> I think it exploded or something. <laughs> they can do that. Yeah. yeah. Boy behind the door, uh, very well shot. Like you said, very taut. Um no frills it's got a nice it's got pam from true blood oh i was gonna say it's got a nice kind of a little twist halfway through but uh yeah it's it, it is just a good movie where you're watching it and you're like uh how how would they get out of here oh maybe they could do this and they do it yeah it is uh i always love when a script does the thing where it knows where you're what you're thinking almost you can tell that the screenwriter 
is thinking about what he or she or they know their audience is going to be thinking and then writing based on that, especially in a movie like this where it's a survival thing. Because naturally your audience is going to be like, okay, well, how would I get out of this if I were in this situation? So the character does the things that as an audience you're sitting there going, okay, I would do this, this, this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There are some moments of uh, surprisingly graphic gore, the fingernail. Oh, oh yeah, I bet you forgot about the fingernail, and I then did. I bring it up, and it's just oh. there's some finger trauma in this mm. that I don't appreciate at Nasty all. Nasty stuff there. Yeah. Uh, and shout out to the writers and directors. Their team, David Charbonnier and Justin Powell, they actually emailed me really? saying that they're huge fans of the channel and that uh, their goal in making a horror movie was to have it featured on Dead Meat. Shut up. No, it wasn't. They fucking said it, dude. And so, uh, you know. That guy's finger, I guess. <laughs> Golden chainsaw. They also made a movie called Gin lately. It may have premiered the same year. Gin, like G-I-N or D- D- D-J-I-N-N. Oh, a gin. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, I kind of want to check that out. They said, when I said I would check it out, they said uh, that was like, made first and with a lower budget so just prepare for that but okay. i told them they made a real good looking movie yeah uh and that you know we were going to talk about it we made a uh, commentary track and now we're talking about it here so shout out to those guys yeah so cool to get that email that's so cool yeah i love that like uh-huh. it, i i was just telling you the other day about how like in 10 years we'll maybe be seeing a crop of horror filmmakers be like yeah i got into it because of dead me and I don't know. I, I'm sure they were making movies before <laughs> yeah. us. Yeah. But the fact that... <laughs> They're like full-ass adults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the fact that like they had a goal of getting featured on Dead Meat is fucking awesome. Oh I God. love that. <laughs> so thanks, it. guys. Absolute mad lads. They did it. Okay, after the boy behind the door, we went out to the theater. And we saw a movie in a oh, jam-packed okay. theater. I was like, when the fuck did we go to the theater? <laughs> it was a special screening. Uh, actually, no, it was available to buy tickets to the public, and I just yeah, snatched them just up real fast. It just was special. Because... It was special because it was Studio 666, and uh, Dave Grohl and the filmmaker and the rest of the Foo Fighters. All the Foo's were there. All the Foo's stopped by in the beginning and were like, hey, enjoy the movie, and then ran off to another theater to yeah. do the same thing. But We waved at Dave Grohl in the parking lot. That's right, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was like coming up uh, when I was going to park, and him and his partner were coming up, and I was like, Hey, and she I, waved back, and I think he was just, like, focused on getting uh-huh, in there. He just wanted to get there. I think what it was is it was, like, you did the kind of wave where you just do to a person in a parking lot, like, hey, I see you. I'm not going to hit yeah. you. And then I think mid that, you realized it was Dave Grohl. Yeah. And it was a... Uh, and it kind uh, of altered the wave of, like, a, <laughs> hey, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but uh, so that was a fun movie, especially to see in that setting in a theater, sold out theater full of people who knew Dave Grohl oh, was going to be there. There was a guy a few seats down from us who was losing his mind. He was so much fun to be in I a mean, theater that theater with. ate that movie yeah, up. Yeah, so that they, was a lot of fun. That helped it a lot. We also saw it with our friend Kira Gardner, yeah. who uh, helped work on the film and did like the, the behind the scenes stuff on it. So that was really cool. Uh, the movie itself, I think, was largely a successful horror comedy. This is a horror comedy mm-hmm. where I think a lot of the jokes land because of the band's chemistry. Um, You hear that there's going to be a movie starring the Foo Fighters, and you may think like I did, like, okay, they'll be in it, and there will be other actors carrying the movie. Mm -hmm. But no. No, it's them the entire time. Yeah, this movie is about them, heavily featuring, obviously, Dave Grohl, who holds his own as an actor. Mm -hmm. He is uh, solid enough to carry this movie, especially a movie in this tone. The rest of the band are by no means actors, but they're just so likable and their yeah. rapport with each other. Their, their chemistry is so fun and cute and you can tell they just had a lot of fun yeah, making it. What's great is that they all completely committed to the movie. None of them are like winking at the camera or half-assing it or being like, oh, we're in this stupid horror comedy. Like, Yeah, it feels like they all took it seriously yeah. as much as it's not a serious movie. Even at all. Pat, who's... Smiling Pat's my, through hat. That's my favorite part. Yeah, Pat just smiling through all of his lines is so <laughs> like, funny. Like, to how me. many takes did they have to do? Like, Pat, could you smile you don't a little need less? To smile for this line, but he's just so smiley the whole movie. <laughs> he's such an adorable he's man. He's the cutest man. Yeah. I'm obsessed with, with him. his little nighty when he's like yeah. sleeping in the kitchen. Uh, the other great thing about this movie is the gore. No oh, man, they go there is all fucking out. There's on... a specific scene. <laughs> is that... it the double kill? Yes. Yeah. 
of it's course it is. very good. <laughs> Easy golden chainsaw, but like... Painting the walls with blood in that scene. Holy yeah. shit. Fucking phenomenal gore. Yeah. They go all out. Uh, the movie's about half an hour too long. Yes. Which is its biggest, I think, uh, downside. Biggest for sure. There, It feels like there are four endings. It, it ends a few different times. And each time I was like... All right. And oh, also, we're still going. I think if you're not like a, mu- a music fan in terms of... So I, I love watching music documentaries. Uh, con- I love going to concerts. I love watching concert films. I'm into... Like if I... I don't play music at all, but I daydream about being in a band. You know, <laughs> it's just... I'm obsessed with, with bands, especially rock. Like I, mm-hmm. I fucking love rock music so yeah. goddamn much. And... I could see scenes where if that's not your thing, it could be boring because there's a lot of scenes where it's just them playing them music, playing, yeah. which I liked. Mm-hmm. But if that's not your thing. You know, that's a good se- thing to say uh, that it helps if you're a music fan. Yes. <laughs> but I don't think you necessarily have to be a hardcore Foo Fighters fan. No, not at all, because I'm not. I'm, yeah. I don't really know a ton about Foo I am Fighters. a very casual fan. And before this movie, I didn't know the names of the other band members. I only knew Dave Grohl. But the movie, mm-hmm. you know, I only knew Nate. Oh, and Dave. Oh, yeah. Nate's yeah, the Nate, the player. bassist. Yeah, I should have known Taylor. I've been playing fucking yeah. Learn to Fly nonstop since I've learned drums. But uh, what's great is that you don't need to know them ahead of time. They make their personalities clear throughout the film and establish who they are, and that's really fun. Uh, so just being a cursory fan of them or rock music, I think, does help and should be enough. You don't have to be a mega Foo Fighters fan. No, but no, if no. you are, you're probably going to fucking love this movie. Yeah. Because it's all Foo all the time. And it's got a great uh, supporting cast, too, between... Will uh, Forte shows Will Forte up. pops up. Jenna Ortega's in there. Screen yeah, Queen Jenna, Jenna Ortega. Ortega. Uh, Leslie Grossman is in it, and mm-hmm. she's great. And, you know, I, I didn't watch Whitney, but I thought Whitney Cummings was Whitney pretty Cummings good in this. Whitney Cummings is good in this. Yeah. I, I thought... I, I didn't watch Whitney, but I heard it was not the best sure yeah <laughs> uh jeff garland is also in this <laughs> and jeff, <Garland's laughs> jeff also garland in is this. also in this uh but yeah i think that you know it's probably the way we saw it definitely shaded the experience <laughs> yeah if we yeah. sat at home watching this probably wouldn't have liked it as much but i do think it's funny enough just given their commitment and chemistry it got a few genuine laughs out of me yeah especially yeah. pat uh there are some like downtime in the middle of the movie when it gets too plotty it sounds like there were a lot of rewrites and it just it gets too much into the plot of like the demonic possession and stuff but overall a fun time if you're a foo fighter fan definitely see it mm-hmm. and if you're a gore fan check it out it's got plenty oh yeah uh it'll be a good kill count for sure uh, VHS 94. Oh, VHS 94. I loved VHS 94. It just, it, it has so much going for it. It looks fucking cool. Everyone's commitment to making it look, I think everyone shot with old either camcorders or just old equipment and transferring using old equipment too. Even the wraparound story is fun and goofy. I think it's the weakest point, but it's fine. It reminded me so, cause the the whole wraparound or at least the vibe towards the end with like the two girls in it reminded me, have you ever seen that video that was made at U of M in like 1980? like seven or something where it's two girls who clearly they would have lived in east quad for sure who were <laughs> like they have pet rats and they're like to have more skate witches in our gang that way we could run all the whip boy skateboarders off the streets but we have our standards if you don't have a rat you can't be one of us besides the wraparound which involves like raiding a play like a cult house full of uh videotapes there were four segments uh hal ratma was the first one which yeah which i Hill is, Ratma, we love Ratma. Fucking cool ass creature design. Mm-hmm. That whole segment is just really funny too. Yeah, the, I loved funny. the the main character, the reporter, just being like, "We have to document what's going on here." And then also, but <laughs> I think her cameraman points out, "Oh, get your Pulitzer right." It just, yeah, it's very Gail Weather. It, it's like yeah, uh, it Gail Weather's with more Gale. of a a sheen on her of like trying to pretend she's yeah. Uh, Gail Weather's if Gail Weather's tried harder to pretend she was being a good person. Yeah, it's for great. sure. And uh the ending to that one is fucking awesome. Dude, love it. The, ooh, the gore is just 
it's so tasty. It just is so, it looks so good. So and it's so funny too. Yeah, that's probably the one that people know the most. Yes. Especially just because the Hal Ratma thing is there. Um, what was the second the one? The funeral home one. The funeral home. That is the one that I forget the most, but it was solid. I think the, uh, I, I worry that this one gets overlooked because it has so much uh, to love about it. I think the main character, the girl, is really good because it's a lot of her just by herself mm -hmm. and talking on the phone, which is just at, you're acting with nothing. And the effects look great. Yeah, when it the effects are like, so the climax. cool. The, there's like a, I mean, what? They just destroyed a building. I don't know how they filmed <laughs> yeah. this end part, but the the very very end, the last kind of scare is so good because mm -hmm. at first, the the kind of I don't know how cagey we're being about spoiler. It's hard. To, it's tough. Yeah. Uh, the kind of monster in this, you 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 start to feel like, oh man, maybe seeing too much of this thing, and okay, we can cut away from it now. I don't want to see anymore. But then there's a last little scare that, ooh, I, I liked. It got me. I'll say that this one feels the least like it's 1994. Sure. Which is the premise of the movie. But I'm not going to hold that too much against there's it. There's not it's still too fun. many markers in that, to be fair, to make it seem like the 90s. Because funeral homes still just kind of yeah, look like they've that. they always look the same. And there's not much besides what the cordless phone that she's using and the Something, camcorder yeah. yeah there's not a ton but uh third one was the um uh, the video game one <laughs> yes it becomes a video game i forget game at what the that end. segment was called uh it was like and i forget where it's the lab right with yes. the guy making basically androids i don't know he's basically grafting robot pieces onto humans in this fucked up lab it's that called gets the rated. subject yeah, and the subject. uh it is by an indonesian filmmaker timo Ch chajanto mm -hmm. is an indonesian uh short yeah this one it, first of all the lighting in this one is so good <laughs> there are a few moments where i just was so excited about the way certain things were lit with the use of colors and stuff. Like, he just clearly understands how certain colors, you feel like they are moving forward in the frame and other ones feel like they're moving back. So I feel like there's at the beginning where you see people, I think you see it's like two people and they're kind of on like operating tables almost. And there's like all this yellow and blue and kind of green and everything is just so uh, purposely colored and lit. And it just it just looks really fucking good. I don't know how else to describe it without you listening, just going and looking at it. It's just yeah. nice. Do you mind when it gets uh, video gamey and action? That's when I'm not as interested in okay. it. Although there's moments within that that are so brutal and really cool. Some and cool kills the choreography is incredible. But yeah. there are a few moments where it just feels like it's going on. And just like gun, gun, shooting. A while, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I liked it. It's another one that doesn't feel quite like 1994. It's, it, it looks better. Uh, like the video footage looks better than it should maybe. That, but... I, I think that too. It mm. looks it doesn't look as old as the other ones yeah. did. And then the last segment is Terror, which Terror feels is my, a, dude, right out of Terror 1994. Terror is my, my favorite segment. This could have I'm been obsessed. found on a VHS tape in someone's... Guys, I'm obsessed with this I mean, it short. takes place in Michigan, so we're going to be biased. It does take place in Michigan, but I loved it before that, okay? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's about this fucking militia, this like far-right militia in the w it it truly looks like you found these tapes somewhere it's so real it just feels so fucking it's, real between their attire and just the way they look they look like 1994 guys yeah and just their mannerisms like every single actor in this nails the like kind of lameness of <laughs> yes. what this group of dudes would be yeah, it's hilarious it's too it's so funny in such a dark way mm -hmm. and there's it, the aesthetic of it, just like this, again, it's very Michigan, but the aesthetic of these guys and this like really patriotic militia and it just, I, the entire time I was like, fuck, I'm mad I didn't make this. I'm so pissed I didn't make this. And what's great too is that obviously, you know, it's kind of commenting on modern day cultural mm -hmm. things but it's not wrong to have it in 94 when you because this is very much very reminiscent of the oklahoma, oklahoma city, city that's all bombing, i can think which of 95 because they um at one point 
when they're scouting out a building, uh, they're like, oh, this one has a daycare center. And that's the, the Oklahoma City bombing. Mm -hmm. That was a, a daycare center where like, yeah, a lot of kids died. And my mom actually was working uh, for the city. She worked like downtown Detroit back then. And that, that year she she quit. Um, because she was worried something would happen to her or me, you know, mm -hmm. being at like a daycare center or something. So that instantly, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I mean, we won't even talk about the ending, but like. It's, it's the best. It's like the it the rules. red the beginning of it's great in how it's constructed and made and it's funny. And there's like a little bit of like a mystery of what they're talking about. And then the payoff is just yeah. fucking. Funny in a dark way, by the way. Yeah. I will say this is not like a laugh out. Like these guys aren't like do do goofy. Like no. they're, they're, I think if, if I find it funny in a very specific way that like it appeals to me and I understand what I think the director understands is funny about this yeah. kind of thing where it's if you don't laugh you'll scream kind of thing yeah but you know if they were real life people you wouldn't scary, be laughing yeah. it's a scary situation a, but I, I i was just listening to a podcast where someone described the feeling of that kind of you know people on the far right who are just so fucking goofy but also oh my god it's it's scary it's it's the it's ralph wiggum like haha i'm in danger kind of <laughs> it's that kind of feeling yeah uh not really a horror movie but it was based on a stephen king story we watched stand by me oh yeah stand by we don't me. have to talk too long about it, but like it was the first time either of us i had, had seen never it. seen it that was a big blind spot for me yeah. i i just that movie fucking rules that movie's so good like it's obviously it's good okay if you're listening to this <laughs> and you've seen it you're like yeah of course it's fucking good i just i had never you know seen it uh growing up ever or as a teen and i think i just wrote it off i wrote it off as like oh it's it's 80s and people are just nostalgic for mm -hmm. it and whatever uh so we watched it just because it was on netflix i think and it i i loved it it's it so beautiful be, we might have just rented it but like dude if you're ever in the situation where or maybe it was on netflix whatever if you're ever in a situation where you're like i want to watch a movie but i don't know what to watch Watch Stand By Me. It's 90 minutes. Yeah. It's shorter than you might think it is. And it's just a fucking solid movie. It's, it's got like heart. It's got humor. It's one of the, because I've read a lot of Stephen King and he's really hard to adapt as we've seen with many <laughs> bad adaptations. But when a Stephen King adaptation is good, it understands the kind of emotion I think that he puts into a lot of his writing where it's just very like his coming of age stuff is always and this is so fantastic the and this is age. like an ultimate coming of age yeah. thing and just like it's so melancholy and um really touching and also just the very um like boys being friends and being vulnerable around each other is yeah especially considering this came out in the 80s 86 and yeah. there's we we talked about Thatcher era uh, era England and you think Reagan era America it's back to tradition and maybe the idea especially god when did the AIDS crisis start what year in the 80s I forget but I I can't imagine that I think people were maybe I don't know I I, I just have to imagine that a movie where it's like so much it's men crying and hugging each other and holding each other and there's something really nice about that yeah. Especially when you think back to when it came out. Acting, amazing. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen too many River Phoenix movies, but I get it now. Yeah. Like, holy fucking shit. I know. Wow. Yeah. That performance just, like, feels like it is an adult playing it, and he was, like, 16 years old. Yeah. Uh, and, um, uh, shit, who's Will the... Will Wheaton. Corey Feldman. Corey Feldman, of course, playing playing and the weirdo. And Jerry, Jerry O'Connell before his the, amazing glow up. <laughs> oh my God, what a glow up for no, sure. No, but uh, Kiefer Sutherland as the bully. Jeez. Holy Kiefer's, shit. I, Kiefer Sutherland, ultimate 80s bully, I think. Between this and The Lost Boys, which came out the, the next year, they had to have seen this and been like, he's oh, scary. he's our vampire. He's so scary. So good. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Stand by me. Big recommend. Yeah. I just surprisingly love that movie. It, yeah, it really, the end of it really got me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Coming Home in the Dark. Oh, boy. This is a movie that I put on my second monitor while I was doing shit, expecting to half pay attention. Ten minutes in, I stopped what I was doing and just watched that. I finished it. 
I told Chelsea, you need to watch this movie. The next night, I watched it a second time with her and loved it. Even I fucking loved this I, movie. I absolutely loved this movie. Yeah. The more that I sit with this movie, too, it just... It's like... I, I loved it when I watched it and then it just it's like Teton where the more I think about it and think back about it the more that I I keep realizing things about it uh it's hard I, I, god I want to spoil this one so bad we but this one is it. like this one especially so worth going in not knowing anything about I had no idea yeah so our what, comments might be brief on it but um it is a bleak movie yeah it's very uh it's a tough watch but I will say if if you if you give this movie a shot and you're like this is this just going to be the whole thing like is this is it going to be this much of a bummer the whole time yes and no <laughs> it's yes, not yes but not without purpose it has a reason it's not just what you think it's going to be the whole time i yeah. guess is what i'll say keeping it vague there's a reason that the tone is what it is there's a reason it's hard to watch and yeah. Yeah, it's a New Zealand film. There's no rape in it, if you're... That's true. So I'll say that. It's not like, a oh, this is like a hard-to-watch movie because of violence against women like that. That's not yeah. what this is. That, okay, yeah. good call. Uh, Daniel Gillies Fuck. gives a amazing Mandrake, performance. Dude. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone in the cast. It's a very small cast. It's a very kind of small movie. Um, yeah. It's intimate. Yeah. And it's into it, but also it's so big and lonely. Big the, and lonely. The yeah. landscape. The landscape. It's so oppressive. Beautifully and shot. It's gorgeous, but also just feels like no one, there's no one in the world except these characters almost. Yeah, it's desolate. Yeah. Which lends itself to a kind of helpless feeling. Yeah, for sure. Such joyous words we're using to describe this movie. But it, it like, it's. I, I was very moved by it, yes. I'll say. I, I came away feeling very, like, it It definitely, um, it's it's emotional. It's not just needlessly cruel or mean or Which shocking. Which some people thought it was. I saw I, reviews saying that. I saw reviews, of course, saying that it was boring because <sighs> maybe it is a quieter movie. But, like, fuck, I don't man. know how it you, just, it's so tense. How are you bored? Yeah, that's the other thing is. It's like my ass was clenched that whole movie. <laughs> it is a very scary movie in the sense of like. The, what if this fear happened? Four people. Yeah. Yeah. Man, it is. Uh, I, I don't know. I just loved it. There's a reason I watched it twice in two days. I don't know the last time I did that with a movie. Like. Yeah. I, I just finished it and couldn't wait to watch it again. And um, if you think you can handle some intensity. Uh, please check it out. It's phenomenal, and I hope that more people see it because, like, yeah. it's it you know flew under the radar probably because it's New Zealand. It's not an American film. Lower yeah, budget. I, I I couldn't believe I didn't hear more about this movie because I thought it was just so good. It's so fucking good. Okay. Um, I, the last one that we watched together was the Dead Zone. Um, the Dead Zone, <laughs> dude. Okay, the Dead Zone. Another um, Stephen King. More Stephen King, Christopher Walken, Cronenberg, a lot of things that I like. Um, it's not the best Cronenberg. It's the most normal Cronenberg. Yeah, it's... It, it's easy to forget he made this. Exactly. If you told me someone else made it, I'd be like, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Martin Sheen in this, <laughs> playing a politician that I just... If the West Wing was his character as president, better show. <laughs> just su like such a better show. And then we all know what the finale would be. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, Dead Zone, I don't know. I thought it was fine. Yeah, I, I like it. I think you like this one I think more than I me. liked it more than I think because it was so 80s in the way that I find very cozy. Because it's early 80s. It's yeah. 81, right? Uh, 83, I think, maybe. Yeah, so but it's yeah, still early, early 80s. 80s kind of cozy. I don't know how. Lots of, like, chunky sweaters. Yeah, Christopher Walken is a teacher. Yeah. Who gets uh, into an accident. With a milk truck. It oh. didn't have to be a milk truck. After I just thought like he didn't have to crash into a milk truck because there's milk <laughs> pouring everywhere. And it just it seems like that would have been more expensive than just he hits <laughs> right. a truck. But it just had to be a waterfall <laughs> of milk coming out. 
Yeah, he uh, he goes into a coma for like how five years, five fucking years, which is nuts. Yeah. Uh, and then when he comes out, he has this power, like kind of psychic power. Yeah, when he touches people, I think specifically, it's like when he holds people's hands, mm-hmm. he gets flashes of either their past or future. Um, and the future is he discovers is changeable. He can. What's fun about this movie is that it's Christopher Walken acting. This is yeah, it's, this we, is before Christopher Walken's job was to be Christopher Walken. That's yeah. I I think we were talking about that. Like, do people now think of him even as an actor? Because when's the last time he acted in stuff? I don't. I think he's he's always acting in stuff. I or think, at least he's always in but yeah, stuff. Yeah, I think literally his job now is just being Christopher like, Walken. Walk on, do the walking thing. But like this is him like playing a character, <laughs> yeah. acting, and it's fun to see like an earlier uh, era Christopher Walken when he was still kind of earning that legendary status. My issue with this movie is it just feels uh, like a bad Stephen King adaptation in the sense that King stories often go on very detailed tangents about the most minor of characters and just background and history of the the town that they're in and everything. This does take place in Castle Rock. Yep. I think it's the first story of his that did take place in Castle Rock. Um, this movie feels like it did a kind of haphazard job of adapting these things, and you are left with a lot of questions like there's like this bodyguard character in the movie Mm -hmm. who we're watching it and he's just kind of there and i'm like i bet in the book they go into deep detail about (laughs) it i briefly looked looked it up up, and yep there's this whole backstory about he wound (laughs) up in that job but there are just like these scenes that feel a little random like when martin sheen and that uh, bodyguard go and harass a guy and i know it's to establish he's like an unsavory character but i thought that was he's he's a and, and crooked politician. Sure. And speaking of Martin Sheen, fun performance, but like he ends the up best. being the big bad of the movie and he's not brought in he's, until way too late. Yeah. There's not a lot of tension between him and the main character. Not even in terms of like them like having a relationship with each other, but just their stories running parallel to each other, I feel like. And I think what, the book, it's more I think it back is and forth. Back and forth like but that. But this, it's arranged where it's that like all comes It's like episodic almost. End. It's a very episodic movie. There's like yeah. the ice skating vignette and like uh, just all these little The like... ice is gonna break. <laughs> you do a better walking than me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's fine. You could spend worse ways. I, I liked it. And I Chelsea found it, it cozy. <laughs> and I don't know. There's something just really fucking funny to me about Martin Sheen. Like just a weird flash forward to Martin Sheen in this room with like a fireplace and his bodyguard being like, we're launching the nukes, damn it. And he just punches in a punch code on this. Like, I don't know. It's like a hand scanner with these rainbow colored buttons. Just do, 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 do. Hand scan nukes. He, it's just, I don't know. There's something just very funny about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not all bad. No, it's, it's fine. Yeah. I watched a few movies by myself that I'll just briefly comment on. The okay. Town That Dreaded Sundown. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was a, less a, of a horror movie than I expected. It's, that's a Sackhead guy, isn't it? That's Sackhead, yeah. Yep. It's very early 70s. Yes. Uh, and it feels it. It feels like a... That's um, based on true events, yeah. Uh, it says it is, at least. I forget if that's actually true or not. But it's a lot of narration of, like, on this day, these people were oh, doing okay. this. Like, it's that throughout the whole movie. Uh, it's not too much of a horror movie, but I watched it, and it was... Fine. I don't know. It it's one of those ones movie. that I don't think I've ever sat and watched, but I feel like I have because I've seen so much from it. Yeah. yeah it's definitely one you can just watch the highlights of actually sitting down and watching it. I don't know. I wasn't too enthralled. I watched We Need to Do Something. That's a fun little bottle movie. It's uh, basically a family in a bathroom the entire time uh, trapped in there after a tornado knocks a tree in front of the door, like through their house in front of the door. And then it's like some some things start to happen where it's more than just that. And it's like, is this supernatural? Mm -hmm. Uh, Vanessa Shaw is in it, Mm, who was in um, Hocus Hocus Pocus. Pocus. And before that, Home Sweet Home, uh, that real low budget 80s like uh, Thanksgiving horror movie where she's the little girl. But that movie was fine. (laughs) Uh, And then in preparation for my (laughs) what's your favorite scary movie talk with The Bunny Alley, I watched seven of the Puppet Master movies. Yep. 
you've just been all puppet master all the time. It's fine though, because I have them on. I'm playing games while they're playing. I've only seen two of them. What's the set? Oh, you saw the original and the and the new one. The reboot with uh, Barbara. Actually, both actually, of them no, have wait, Barbara. Actually, no, wait. I think I have seen the second. I don't think you do, because here, does this ring a bell? He's dressed up like the Invisible Man the whole time. Then Ooh. no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then no, because okay. you would remember Andre Toulon with a awful German accent looking just like the Invisible Man. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're not good movies, but they're <laughs> fun if you grew up with them, which sure, is what yeah. me and Allie did. So we had a fun, long talk about it. But those are the movies we've been watching lately. A lot of movies. Yeah. yeah. Um, probably should still watch more, but I know it's we're doing hard. what we can. I mean, I also, all I want to do now is play Elden Ring, so. Yep. You're on that grind, and that's fine. I've been streaming Elden Ring, by the way. Oh, yeah? If people want to watch me play it. That is on the Dead Meat James Twitch. I wonder if we can change that name. I don't know. Uh, but... Chelsea's, yeah, your streams taking are taking over the Dead Meat Twitch to stream Elden Ring. It's People a lot like it. of fun. And you're having a good time. I'm, and I'm happy a great to see time. you happy. I might stream after you record this. Yep, I guarantee you're I'm going, going to. to. <laughs> I don't know. I said I might. I'm going to. I just fucking love it. It's just so beautiful, and it's kind of spooky. A few people suggested doing an episode about it, and I'm like, that would just be me talking at James <laughs> for an politely. hour. Oh, You'd honey. be nodding and. What did the jellyfish do? <laughs> Jellyfish has saved my life on many occasions. <laughs> we did it, Jellyfish. We did it, Jellyfish. <laughs> all right. Great. Thank uh, you all for being patient with us this week. Yeah, we... this month, you know, we were like, hey, let's do this horror award show. Oops. So much, so much more, more work, work than, than we, we thought. thought. So much more work. Oopsies. <laughs> and I'm hoping it's worth it in the end. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. But tune in for that. And then we've got other cool shit. Uh, Zoran's still kicking ass with the Tremors kill counts. We... Uh, just hired two writers for the yeah. channel and they might be able to help uh, us get a Chelsea kill count sometime soon. So our fingers are crossed for that. Like I said, what's your favorite scary movie is coming back. AEW edition. Mm -hmm. They've been great. Uh, really fun conversations there. And yeah, I don't know. I think that's it. I think that's it. The merch is still there. Yep. Oh, and someone asked if deadmeatpod at gmail.com is still active. Yes. Yes. You can email that. I just get a lot of emails now, so I don't really have time to respond to very many of them. Yeah. So. If you don't get a response, please don't feel offended. Yeah, don't feel bad. I We're doing what we can with the time that we have and still wanting to like exercise and <laughs> yeah. play drums for me and you know live our lives but we're doing the best we can and we love you all for uh being understanding yeah social media oh yeah dead me james twitter instagram tiktok and twitch where you yeah. can find chelsea yeah and stuff <laughs> and i'm at carebeck c-r-e-v-e-c-c -E -E on twitter and instagram is that it i think that's it dead me store dot com, store dot com. Is uh, for merch. Oh, yeah. Didn't you? What happened to those new designs you sent? I, I have some new designs finalized. We're still getting them put on stuff and cool. keep an eye out for them. But keep they're not for ready that, yeah. quite yet. Uh, well, until next time, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. And this has been the Dead Meat Podcast. We'll get it one day. <laughs>